And we're back in the Crash Labs. This is the new year, 2024, kickoff to a um, sort of a shit show of a year already. Uh, it's been good for us. We've been uh, we've been we've been kicking ass and and taking names on the uh, on the subsidiary sides with sales and all that fun stuff. But the markets are still not great today. We've got CJ Kim, Matt Wilson, boys. Um, how's the holidays? And and did I sum it up? Man, cr- chaos, chaos. Young kids, chaos. I just found out that I booked PDAC wrong. Ooh, <laughs> I booked the wrong week. Have sitters family going somewhere whole thing this morning someone calls me they're like oh yeah it's still coming but like the whole family i tell i tell my wife she's like that brutal a disaster so that chaos over the holidays that was my holiday nice <laughs> mine was chaotic too i didn't have a holiday you guys did v-rick v-rick if we hey matt so um if you use v-rick as a barometer to the overall sentiment of our industry what do you what did you think of the show well it was one step away from my cab drivers talking to me about uranium stocks. Okay. Right, it was right there. It was almost there. It felt pretty, um, felt pretty intense. I guess the difference between uranium and something like lithium or, or marijuana is that there is this crazy economic, you know, like the price doesn't really matter for the utility. So, so I guess you could say that, but, but that was, it was pretty intense. Like I was on the, L, the escalator going up and someone's like, did you know Bill Gates is building modularized nuclear reactors which of course started like 12 15 years ago and uh but i remember last time i heard that was like 2011 when uranium spiked to did you know china has 38 nuclear facilities under development it's it's the only green energy that can work right so i understand the macro and i believe in it but that was that was a big that was a big theme only thing people were talking about really um but it was packed it was, it was busy with industry people. I don't know what the investor sentiment was like. Maybe they, shut off, they shut off half of the convention center and they squeezed everyone into the other half. So I think optically. But didn't you feel like every corporate person, not, I'm not sure how the retail was, but didn't you feel like every like uh, company, like there's a lot of companies there, I felt like. A lot of um, bankers, a lot, a lot of bankers were there. Um, I don't know what the, the investors, I'm not sure. Was there investors? Was it like, I mean, these things are investor conferences. Like, did, did you see foot traffic at the, going around the booths and stuff? We saw foot traffic. I seen busier. I'm not sure because they did a good job in making it look busy and the talks were, were very good and well attended. But uh, did you walk over to the other convention center to see Roundup at all? No, I didn't get over there. It was like... Service providers were having fun still, but on the money side, it was pretty dry. So that kind of tells you. So wasn't that a little bit like Beaver Creek, where Beaver Creek was packed with companies? Like everyone was at Beaver Creek, wasn't it? Like what were you guys with? I wasn't there, but like I felt like you guys came back and like everyone was there. The investor quality was amazing. And I remember even like the Red Cloud Conference in November, everyone was there. But the but no one's really writing. No one's really buying into things. Other yeah, than I writing. think everybody Let's that see. was there on the buy side even to some degree had some agenda to be there because of whether they're supporting some names that they're are talking about with other people that are, you know, potentially, I don't know. It just doesn't feel like there's a lot getting done at these things. I mean, we, we do well at these things cause we sell, we have yeah. videos, we have like lots of things, interviews mm-hmm. and things like that we're doing and it's worth our time to go there. It's worth our time to send our people. Yeah. And especially in the beginning, really well. yeah, beginning of the year where issuers have, outline the budgets that they want to spend on marketing and stuff. So it's yeah. important that we have a presence there, especially with the acquisition of Northern Miner. We can start cross-marketing a lot of products on top of CEO.ca. Totally. So we had to be there. And then obviously when you go there, you meet with the, the Vancouver crowd and get updates on what they're working on and um, what's in our portfolio. No, Matt likes that because you can get updates on the Van- uh, Toronto people that make the trip out there. I'm not sure. I'm not sure the composition of those conferences is the best measure of the anything. I think if you just look at like the absolute number of attendance, I think that tells you a better. Like when I think back, like the best years in mining, it was like they were the biggest conference yeah. with the most people. Period. Right. It was like absolute size. And then you have lineups. When you go down the escalator, there's line. There was no lineups to get in. Yeah. yeah. There's no lineups. I think this was like I think this was like half half the number of people of like the top number. So it wasn't the bottom. Yeah. I was talking to some banker buddies too that were saying, I was just trying to like I always do that like pick their brains just to see. Um, 
you know, what their kind of deals are seeing, what kind of interest there is on the finance side. And uh, yeah, they basically echoed what you said, which was uranium. That's yeah, pretty <laughs> much it. There is, there is some, as of like the last couple of weeks, been an uptick in interest across the board, but by and large. Uranium, um, uranium is getting is the catching. interest, but if you look at how the actual stocks have done, like URA since the last year is up like 100, over 130%, right? Sub 50 million market cap explorers have only moved 10, 13%. You have like the explorers that are above fifty million that moved thirty percent, but it's really the, the the key names that you know the the chemicals or like the next gens, like the best names in the space are the ones that are moving. Yeah, you want to buy into great and high quality, but we still haven't seen the general spillover into the, the smaller juniors. Really, man, some of these juniors have raised some big dollars though. They, they're using this um, this window to raise a lot. You know, I know that we've done that in the past as well, but the stocks in itself haven't moved. Yeah, I I don't know. I always find uranium's a weird one. I think I find uranium silver to the extent silver's better now than it was, but like I always found that like uranium had limited ways to play. Like it was like, you know, if you really want to play uranium and you really want to catch the pop, there's only sort of like a handful of marquee deals that are really good uranium exposure. And then once you get down into like the discoveries, more speculative side, yeah. it's so far out. And like, especially with the permitting and the this and the that and like the social and the whatever, I feel like these things, like look at next gen. Yeah. Pound for pound cannot be touched in the world for like economic deposits of almost anything. Except ISO. Except for, okay, there you go. So, but I mean like just the, gr the sheer grade volume like if it was gold, it'd be like two ounces per ton, yeah. you know, or something. It's like, it's like absurd, right? The economics are fantastic, et cetera, but it's still not without its challenges. I mean, you still have, you know, like there's like dust, you know, like the, there's certain jurisdictions have like banned uranium mining altogether because of dust and like contamination and like issues with, you know, radioactive, you're, you're mining a radioactive substance. And it's not that easy to do. And certainly to do it safely, like it's doable. Like you can freeze the ground and mine the frozen, you know, ground and whatever to keep. But all of that science, it's a bit of a science project. It takes time. And like uranium, like, like next gen's taken a long time. And the economics were there when it was, you know, it's shitty uranium prices. It still was awesome. So it's kind of like the reactors, they don't get built overnight. Yeah. And so to me, I just don't see anything. I don't know. Have you seen anything on the discovery side um, that's been really like, wow, like... Do you need another discovery with NextGen coming online? Well, that's the real discussion, right? I remember I was sitting with Phil and Rich, and so, you know, Rich on the board of NextGen and runs Mega, which holds a big piece of NextGen, and then Phil runs ISO now from the takeover of Kerr. And so, you know, the Athabasca development, it's like they have a lot of insight on that right and we were kind of i was going over that with them i was like i don't understand why i don't understand uranium it's like a three billion dollar a year market where why or why do you need all of these other projects right like isn't the whole demand of the whole world basically these two projects yeah. um and you know that they were saying there's there's a trade for sure i think that there's country country specific things like you want to secure your own supply so like to to the point of like there's the sweden moratorium that might be lifted right so that's that's a big topic of discussion. So if that if that leaves, then it's like, oh, you know, maybe that um, maybe that will be a thing because Sweden will want to secure their own uranium. I understand that. Um, and America, right? So in the '70s, I mean, like all those crazy low grade um, uranium deposits that that EFR holds and, and now Per and, and things around there and like Colorado and such, those were all mines because they were so subsidized by the American government because they wanted to secure their uranium supply, right? So I guess the argument is back to the alpha generation from Dave Lotan's podcast with you guys, right? Where it's like the, you need the government policy to kind of push things forward. And I think that that would be the only argument really, because otherwise the supply and demand is is tough. Because like you said, Denny, it's like a 25 year. Next Gen started, what, 2009? And it's the best thing in the world. So to get anything else, it's, it's hard. So. Yeah, it just shows you how long it's going to take like to, to get that thing you know, there. And I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty much on the doorstep of it now. I haven't talked to Lee. I'd like to talk to Lee. But I think 2027. I think that's what they're saying. Yeah. Like they're, they're knocking on the door now, like finally, but it, it, I mean, it takes time. Right. And 
And so I, I, I don't know. Like, I, I think if you're trying to play a now thing like that, where uranium's popping, then there's sort of a few ways to play it that are kind of obvious. And then all these like speculative juniors that are hunting for, yeah. well, you know, the next next gen, if they get beyond lucky, they I find I think there is going to be spillover into the space that I just mentioned, like the explorers. Mm-hmm. There is going to be positive externalities that come into this huge wave of capital, continuing wave of capital into the uranium space. Um, where we're sitting at a hundred bucks right now and people are speculating that it's going to go back to that, that, that bull run before Fukushima happened when it like spiked to over 170. Right. And so, you know, when that happens, you will see spillover, um, how long it will last. I don't know. It was pretty short last time, wasn't it? And Fukushima was sort of a bizarre ending to it all. Yeah. Well, that was kind of, it, it went down and then they thought it was the, like the new, uh, bull run in uranium and then fukushima just derailed everything right and killed it yeah 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 it was a tough one yeah it was weird to see yeah. it like, just get gutted it just yeah. got like gutted on its way we don't know where uranium is going but danny and i are right about lithium right on it people didn't like us saying that poo-pooing lithium but lithium is yeah i know how much you guys hate on lithium but if you ignore the covid run i mean zinc was almost two dollars during covid and we don't talk about zinc being over even though zinc is always over, but you know, um, but I think that like it's still fifteen five, right, for the carbonate, and fifteen five. When I started, it was five, four, three, whatever it was. Um, when we all started, right. So, um, the long term, you know, it still makes sense. But again, to, I understand, I understand what you guys are saying about everything. But again, like a good deposit with good grades near surface, if it's hard rock brines that are easy to recover it's still it's still a good thing it's just these the craziness <laughs> the craziness of thinking that things in the middle of absolute nowhere were we're gonna well, work when it's pegmatite and spodge mean right? equals like 60 million dollar market cap base load that is scary <sighs> like that is that's a scary place to be I think that was dropping bu- buzzwords like that yeah. I, I like we're okay. more talking to that than anything else. I believe I believe fundamentally in like batteries. I believe there, there is some like electrification thing that I believe in. I've actually, and I'm going to flip flop one more time on this because yes, the leaf blower and the toothbrush and that whole shit, like hundred percent still believe like important, but, and big, but we've seen a lot of weird shit. Like we've seen a lot of the, uh, the automotive companies know that the cost curve on manufacturing these electric vehicles is cheap. They like that right? They, they, you almost think they don't, right? Cause they haven't mastered it. Like Tesla has, you know what their, their facilities aren't automated set up for this yet, but they've been tooling for it. So, so, you know, Tesla had a big start on this, but like the other ones, so there's, there's sort of like lobbying from, I think the automakers wanting, cause they've already committed to this path. I think they're not willing to shake off of it too much. And we're seeing that echoed like Trudeau and Friedland and other uh, prime ministers and other leaders in other uh, nations are saying, yeah, we've got like un- completely unrealistic goals of 2030, all electric vehicles are going to be the only thing sold and you can't buy a turtle combustion engine after 2030, et cetera, et cetera. That is fucking utter bullshit. Yeah. That is so unbelievably stupid to be- like, to even to even fathom that that's going to stick it through, like the, look at the carbon tax in Canada is probably dead, right? Polyev's going to throw a, a javelin right through the heart of this whole WEF, you know, uh, IPCC, you know, Jerry Butts, Christina Friedland, like uh, all, like no one's buying it anymore. No one cares. It's over, right? So that's the carbon tax side. So that they're losing. They're they're going to be losing. The whole climate alarmism thing is losing steam. Mm -hmm. COVID, they don't look great on COVID, right? Like emergencies act, we've got, you know, there's all this stuff now. And the problem with that is once you lose trust in your institutions, you lose trust in one of these things. So let's say this climate change thing is real and we should care and we absolutely need to be doing these things. It's too late. It's going to get rolled into the, the box of like, well, myocarditis is increased in the vaccines. Well, um, you know, like uh, uh, the Emergencies Act was an overreach and they said it wasn't and et cetera, et cetera. And so all these things are kind of culminating. But I had this very practical observation when I was in Europe. So over Christmas, for some listeners that may not know, my wife's Spanish 
And um, we've got a, a small place in Spain that we go to a couple times a year. It's great. Um, and I love Europe. It's really cool. They're, they love the whole green stuff. Like, they like that whole movement, right? That's, and it makes a lot of sense. Like, these cities are very dense, etc. But the infrastructure in Europe is very old. I mean, you go to Madrid, you go in some of these beautiful buildings in Madrid, like condo buildings, etc. And um, the elevators are like bolt-on, you know, Dyson Krupp, like bolt-on piece of shit little closet elevators to service this huge building that had to be installed way later. The building's like three or 400 years old. And then they had to put this little like, you know, tiny, you know, shoebox little thing. So when you think about how many people live in big buildings like that, condos, things like that, like they, li- they live in a very dense urban environment for the most part. And it doesn't matter what city you go to. It's kind of like this. Um, and the infrastructure in the building's old, the wiring, all the goodies, right? If you go down to the parking lots, like the parking garages under these buildings, which are quite coveted, there's thousands of parking spaces, right? And they're pretty tightly packed and everything. It's all, you know, pretty crazy. There's no way on planet Earth, and I've got electric, a hybrid car with a plug-in charger in my garage. I need to put a 30 amp out of my whatever, 200 amp service, 30 amps had to go to that, right? Alone. And so, and that's only like a whatever, stage two charging. If you take one of these like building complexes, Imagine putting a 30 amp charger in every single parking spot. There's no way the overall service, like electrical service, deliver like the, the, the supply line to these buildings. There's no way that much power is being supplied. Like there, there's no way they're going to be able to do that. So the, the actual logistics of the infrastructure beyond like charging stations in like, you know, instead of gas stations, et cetera, to make that all feasible I'm actually talking about in cities where, you know, and even when we live down here in Toronto, like, like over on, um, uh, just off Dundas by uh, Dundas square, that was a pretty new building and there was no way to get a charging station in the spot. Yeah. I think, like, um, how, how are yeah, they going to do that? No, we don't like 2030. We don't have, we don't have the grid. Think about like, yeah, no. Think about like New York City, which goes through blackouts in the summer because people use air conditioning. Yeah, for sure. Or like the amazing rolling blackouts that happen through the Southwest right now in the U.S. because the power grid isn't set up for everyone because they weren't used to X, Y, and Z, right? Like it's this is a big thing, the rolling blackouts now, right? So it's like, here, let's add massive, like mass. Let's for- so 30 amps. Recharger, 30 amps. Or 15 amps if you want to get the shitty one. It takes you like two days to yeah, charge Where did the year come from? He just chose a generic... Or like he chose a certain time out and said by this time. Like- I the the years are interesting. So I've I've been looking at that. I'm curious about that. And I think it's as idiotic as this. Okay. I think it's it comes down to the IPCC s- setting out guidelines in like the Paris Accord and all these sorts sorts of things where they got a whole bunch of egg- eggheads in a room and they literally set out these arbitrary deadlines and said if we don't reduce carbon by X amount, by 2030, X amount, by 2050, X amount, we're going to have five degrees Celsius, six degrees Celsius in warming over the century by 2100. Then, and, and all of these like important dates and timelines are anchored to some of those things like Kyoto and Paris and all these sorts of things. And then they go, well, what, por- like, where can we find the carbon? Where can we cut it? You know, where's the easiest way to cut it? And it like automotive sector was like a clear one. Mm. And, um, the oddity of it all is that like now when they first came out with the first few reports and drafted a lot of this stuff, we had Jerry on there on here, which was unreal. Uh, and when they first put out the few versions of this report, there was no wiggle room. 99.9% of scientists all agree the climate change is real. 99.9% of scientists and the science is saying, and we're following the science and it's fucking blah, 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 blah right? The reality is they were calling for six degrees warming. They said there's no chance that any of these models are off. And if they're off, they're off by just a little bit, yada, yada, yada. So then in like version four, version five, version six, we're now on version six of the report. The, the, the warming's been dialed back from six to two and a half. And we had one and a half in the last century just cause. 
right? And so, okay, so we're going from one and a half to two and a half. But the policies didn't change. These deadlines, these timeframes didn't change whatsoever. Like the 2030 didn't, oh, now that it's not going to be, you know, three, uh, six degrees warming by 2100, it's only going to be two and a half. Instead of saying by 2030, you got to be all electric cars. Why, why not 2050, you know, or something? Uh, let's not throw the baby out the bathwater. Maybe they should be, we should be striving to make some changes. But at the end of the day, they didn't readjust the plans and they're still anchored into these old things. And so it's super weird that they're not dropping it. It's super weird that they're still pressing this stuff and it's so disconnected from, I think, the public and what the public gives you shit about. Yeah. But regardless of what happens in that narrative, I still like, you know, back to the basic, more fundamental commodities that as we grow, like as we, our populations grow, as GDP grows, I like copper still. Do we, and uh, I think we have good copper exposure. Hey, Matt? Yeah, we're tying it back here into our into our part. I like that tie in there. <laughs> yeah, well, I think, like, it, it, well, no, no offense to any. Like, I, I like. I'm an opinion. You, I'm not like. I'm not just no, no, right. I, no, no, but I agree with. Like, I agree with certain things that you say. Yeah, but I do want to tie it into that we agree with what you're saying and. Some of it, what you're saying, but in the overall narrative, what we're trying to do, that's why we're investing in commodities. That's why we're investing in gold. I'm investing to eliminate fast fashion. <laughs> that's my big thing. Dude, I, I agree completely. I still think there's a place for lithium investing. I still think lithium. We have lithium. A hundred percent. I still think these copper. Are more, are, I'm yeah. very bullish on copper. I believe yeah. the copper prices are huge. Yeah. By the way, in the nuclear thing, I got a cool tidbit whether it's right or wrong. I was talking to a buddy who has a master's in um, metal something, like in manufacturing, like, I don't know, material engineering or something like this, and manufacturing or something. Anyways, he was saying that now they're suggesting that in the all the underground storage facilities, and if they're going to go modular with these uranium facilities, that they're going to have to encase the waste in solid copper like an absurd amount of copper. And so apparently that kind of completely stabilizes things so it can be transported without any like leaking or contamination or something. And it, you, you have to literally entomb the rods in pure copper. I like that. You need beryllium too, don't you? Because I remember, remember James Passon, James Passon ran Firebird in New York. CJ had to have come across him at some point. Um, he uh, he was like trying to control the world's beryllium at one point because beryllium you need them for nuclear and you need beryllium for nuclear reactors. It's one of those fun things. I bet you if you went through that, that would be something you would need also in that copper encased like solution. Could be. I, 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 he said it was just straight up copper. He's yeah, just and he copper? said that so much so that when they did the prospectuses, which they've approved for these, uh, these uh, new storage facilities, like the one that they're putting in in Ontario, et cetera, these stage two or three or whatever deep underground storage facilities, that when they did the prospectuses for these things, they had to price in, I think it was a tripling in the copper pricing. That's how much of a strain cool. they feel that they're going to be putting on the copper market um, by this new demand for, the, for copper. This new use case. Cool. That's interesting. Well, we do have some cool talk. We definitely have some cool copper exploration names. That's for sure. Uh, I'm, I'm bullish on all this stuff. I am. I just don't like, you have to be careful. If, if, why did lithium explode? Did lithium explode because of the universe of things or did li lithium explode because of this EV fucking climate change thing? Don't you think that it sort of exploded though on the, well, I guess all commodities exploded. Like copper was 570. Right? The only thing that didn't really explode was gold. Gold sort of just I don't know. Lithium exploded on its own. There was like everything else was in the shitter. Copper like was there too a little bit. No. Lithium exploded during COVID though, right? Like everything exploded during COVID. Lithium did go up because of the narrative, but we didn't invest like would you say we're more totally bottom up. Hundred percent. We're 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 totally bottom up. No no. Right. We invested, we invested in lithium we, we left in, in lithium names that were located in areas with traditional 
lithium man, like like production. Yeah, we're not in Thunder Bay. We're not right? in fucking Thunder Bay chasing yeah. pegmatites. Yeah. We're in Argentina in the hotbed of lithium production. Unfortunately, we carried over some of those things. Not that they were bad, but we carried over some of the names from previous times. And so that that was that was one of the things last year that was that was actually really tough is that like you got killed. We got oh, killed like, from old yeah, names. But that's like, different. Those uh, were those were like, you know, we're being contracted to go yeah. and help them vector in on pegmatites yeah. like but we had we had those. <laughs> we had those. You know, we had a yeah, few of those. Our legacy portfolio doesn't count. This yeah, I'm not talking about legacy. Well, it, it did. It, it, it did for the 12 months, though. That's all I'm saying. Well, I'm no, saying, for sure. Yeah. But the, the calculus on why we invested is not the same. Yeah. But it's a tough one, Lithium, right now, right? Like, we, man, like that, I'm, it's like beating a dead horse, this NOA, right? This NOA Lithium, these guys are putting out massive results massive it's like this huge thing and no one cares at all right it's like they're gonna come out with a resource it's gonna be great no one cares but it'll hopefully it gets bought um it's tough that's it's it's one of those things with that that's why I like the bottom up to your point like i think that quality projects you can't it's hard to time a cycle unless you just are willing to just only be in one commodity and just sit until the cycle kind of comes because it's so cyclical, right? Like you could have been a uranium bull for 10 years before this all paid off, which of course, you know, a few of them, and now it's great. But for 10 years, you'd nothing yeah, you would really have taken happened, a bath right? on a basket of uranium exposure yeah. for the better part of 10 years. So hanging out, waiting for the clock to be right. It, it, it's a hard one. So I think that when you're, when you're in, when you're in this space, the bottom up is the, it's the only way you, you, you top down is just, I think just, uh, a fortunate fortunate timing right so our good friend tommy had a he had a great presentation at vric and he said three things that move a stock is discovery which which is i think our bottom down approach yep large part of it sentiment change which is very hard like if you're investing on the hard top time down approach, and then the third one is promotion and he's obviously big on marketing and promotion right yeah i've been sold on the effect of marketing and promotion now that I live out in Vancouver, I understand the value of it. I didn't before. I didn't care. Now I understand. It matters. Yeah. It matters. It matters. You have to get. You have to get things. You have to get. And there's so many people that don't know what they're doing. And then there's a few that do. And the skill at ensuring that people understand why something matters, like it's so funny because it's a public market venture market, right? Like it's a venture capital for mining is public, so it's not like private where your funding all comes from Silicon Valley, and you have to, you know. You're making a pitch. It's, it's it's different world, right? You have to get people to care because if people don't care, what what happens? You have no money, so no matter what, you can't move something forward unless you have money. It's the end of the it's the end of the story. Well, you can't attract any serious money. Yeah, for sure. So or drill a hole to make the discovery, right? Or you need serious money to make a success. Like money, in some ways, buys success in this industry because it's a it's a spend money business. It's not a make money business. It's a spend money business. And so to drill holes, you need money. And to, to, you know, (laughs) he who drills more holes will make more discovery, period, Mm -hmm. right? And so you need more money to do that. And if you you take that back, you go, okay, well, how do you get big amounts of money? And it's like, well, big amounts of money, you're deterred from investing, uh, to your point, Matt, in this industry specifically, it's not one that rewards private exposure at all. We're not VCs investing in privates. Um, That doesn't apply here. These names need to be public because they need to offer liquidity. The capital that that is interested in this space wants the guarantee of some amount of liquidity. And so in order to garner more liquidity to get greater amounts of capital, you have to market. Yeah. And there are the rare exceptions at the beginning where you can find, I was having a chat about this uh, last Tuesday, actually, and I was meeting for someone for lunch. And there's a couple guys, right? Been in this, been in the space for a long time, bankers, sales guys, industry guys, um, one of them runs this uh, copper play down in Mexico that we own, which is which is looking pretty cool. And some of the guys from um, a few banks and and all of us were just sitting there being like, man, real killer right now is Time Horizon, mm. right? So to the point of promotion, right? It's like you need people who put money in to be like, I'm okay holding. I like you. I'm holding in the true venture sphere, sphere right? Like we talk about the J curve and this three to five year time horizon, but we <laughs> this industry is not three to five years, right? It's like four months in a day and so that is a tough space when you're trying to build like if you think about venture mining like any other venture business like you have to prove a concept grow your concept create a business like it's like the same thing it's just a long time frame right so um 
And so in this case, it's, it's, it's a tough space, right? So if you don't have that promotion full circle early, if you don't have the promotion so that you can buy yourself that time, that's what I'm, that's what I'm finding. Unless you make a kick ass discovery, right? Like if you drill like an amazing hole, you're probably okay. If you, but even then, even then, like if you, if you don't, Danny, you talk about this all the time. You're like, man, I see companies all the time. They drill some huge hole. And when their stock is a dollar, they raise $5 million instead of raising 30 or tw like, and then you're good forever, but you raise five and then you need to keep going and going. And so I think that like that promotion is a big part because you get the opportunity to raise. Um, and then you have to take that advantage of that. Right. So did you get a different feel when you switched to Vancouver in the summer? Did you get a different feel for the, I mean, granted, no, I don't think the sentiment here has changed. So in the summertime here in Toronto, it was as jaded and dejected from mining as it is today. Did you feel like there was an epic shift when you stepped into Vancouver? Were you like, oh, these guys don't hate mining so much right now. They're actually a little bit more warmer and receptive to this right now. Or, or not at all. No, people are pretty down on it here too. Like it's just everyone is, everyone's pretty down across the board. I think that the only difference I would find between here, the biggest, not the only difference, the biggest difference I found between here as I've gotten more comfortable and, and, and meet more people here and then in Toronto is that in Vancouver, some people just don't care because they're like, it doesn't really impact what we're doing because you still go out, form a new business, promote the story, raise money. And you can kind of do, if you're good at that, you can kind of do that in any market. We don't really do that as much in Toronto, but we do, you know, we, they, it's still, the, it's still the same. I think that just people, it's a bit more of a puppy mill in Vancouver, I think. Well, that's where like Vancouver has been. That's, that's the basis of it. Right. It's like a small business. Like it, that is what the Vancouver stock exchange was formed. Right. It was like to turn things over. It was like new ideas. It was like new properties and stuff like that, whereas Toronto was a bigger board and is, is more advanced. Right. And so I have, that is for sure still a mentality thing, right. Is that it's, it's not. You don't have the amount of capital in Toronto as you do in Vancouver. So there's smaller deals and you got to get things, smaller deals moving. And so people still need to make money. So I think the amount of capital in Vancouver than you do in Toronto. Yeah. Way more in Toronto, right? Like there's way more money in Toronto. I think that someone was told me that like in 2018 or 2019, like 65% of all money raised in mining was in Toronto, something, something like that, like some big number. It's a big number when you think about it as a global space. Right. So, um, Vancouver is not, is a dot on that, right? It's a dot even though you have so many mining executives live out here and you have so many mining companies started out here, right? It's, it's still, so, so it's just a different mentality that way, but still people very down. It's, not, it's hard. It's a hard space now. It's really tough. I, I, I still, I, I still love it though. I think that there's still value. I, I think if you just, like you said, take a bottom up approach, stick mm -hmm. to your nating, it doesn't matter what you invest in. You could lift it in lithium, bismuth, beryllium, fucking you name it. Bismuth. Yeah. Secret type bismuth. <laughs> yeah. I always want to talk about bismuth. <laughs> Just to share with the universe my my idea, and that it's like dead now. The world is but not ready for this. I don't think it, the world. The world's not ready. The thirty million dollar market of bismuth is maybe not. <laughs> In the titanium corner update, they did just get ten million dollars in a strategic investment from the Saudis for three and a half. So, oh, I like just it. Just letting you guys know. <laughs> How, how is that doing? Was this where are we at with our titanium paint deal? Ti titanium corner. <laughs> it's yeah. What's the uh, titanium mat? It's up there. It's still up there. It's doing great. They just they just raised that uh, eleven. You know, it's funny the the three people. What's the ticker on this deal? stuff? Do you bring it up? Like E E E in London. Yeah. E E E London. LME. Empire Metals. Empire Metals. It's, it's just such a giant forty kilometer system. It's just so big. And it's, it's Neil O'Brien, right? He's, he's the chairman of the company and it was a sediment hosted copper play. And then it just has all this ilmenite and it's, it's, it's just a really giant metal system. It's just really, really big. People seem to really like it. I don't, I truthfully, like, I don't really get it. <laughs> we, we own it. Like I, we, we played because it's such a big metal system, but it's like, it's titanium. There's all the, there's some macro about titanium replacing aluminum, but I, I don't know. <laughs> They love it. They like it, it's it's amazing. The London market, and it's a few people I've talked to actually, because you know how definitely in VRIC, CJ, back to your first question, which was like, what was one of the macros? So many people talking about how only in Australia do stories matter and yada yada, right? And uh, which is so funny because you know there are some stories we own in Australia. They're like maybe we should list here in Canada, and it's a whole thing. And um, so no one's ever happy with their market. But London, it seems, seems to be getting this massive liquidity push because there's not a lot of product. So people are now dual listing in London. People are thinking about London and it's like empire. This, this stock on a titanium discovery is traded like hundreds of millions. It's, it's amazing. It's like the liquidity is bananas. Yeah, what's, 
telling us? Is that telling us that this is awesome, or is that telling us that, geez, like it's or they have a really good promotion machine? <laughs> London's hungry for anything right now. London and I know like rare earths are catching a bit in some places. Like the Australians love rare earths. What we would do? Where would we go for a rare earth? We've looked into rare earth a bunch of times. So, what would be our Brazil? Plan? I liked your your. Um, what was it? The the Peruvian one, the clay. In Peru. that, was a, that was a fun yeah. one. Yeah, that was fun. I, th- I thought they were Brazil. Like the, uh, the ionic clays, right? Yeah, the ionic clay, yeah. yeah. I wouldn't touch it. I, I don't know. Like the monzonite things don't seem to be a thing. Mm-hmm. Um, it's too hard. Like all the gadgetry of tomorrow. Like yeah. all the, There's a company, Quebec Rare Earths. It's I forget what the ticker is. Anyway, it's really small right now. Um, they bought the only project in North America that the Japanese ever thought, like the like Jogmek and Otochu and those guys ever thought was going to work, uh, which was the Madamex project called Kipua. And the Kipua asset got a $40 million JV with Toyota in back in 2013. And they put some money in and they tried to build it out. And they just, I think the metallurgy in the pilot plant, like they, it was a whole joint venture. It was a big thing. They just could not. So who owns this now? Uh, it's Quebec Rare Earths, I think. John Jens' company. Um, it's a small thing. It's a small thing right now. Um, you know, they're putting this stuff together, but it's like Kipwa. Kipwa got bought by some Australian company, actually, from who was it with? It was with um, Vincent, knows the guys really well. Uh, anyway, the, I forget what the company's called, but this company had bought it for $8 million. It was like an earn in. I think they spent five hundred grand. They're like, forget it. <laughs> so it's just a really, it's just a really hard space because it's more science project than it is. Yeah, all of these. Is it Quebec things. Rare Earth Elements Corp? Yeah, I think that's it. Q R E E. I think oh, it's like 13, 14 cents right now, something like that. What six cents? Six cents. Oh, even better. Two million multi cap. Yeah, something really. I think that's what it is. Anyway, so that like they have it. Like it's very. That's just being reformed right now. I mean, it's. Uh, that's the thing, right? With this, because it's just they're all the processing is what gets yeah. you. Yeah. Right unique everything is a unique thing there's no off-the-shelf sort of solution um to process things. i'd rather own copper <laughs> like rare earths remember like i like there was a craze in 2011 in rare earths and i remember there were like john hikeway at byron and louisa moreno like there was like three people in toronto that really knew what they were talking about and and, and you know i tried to really understand it because you know no one else wanted to and so um you're going to like rare earth conferences the same 10 companies and and you know I think UCOR, that thing up in Alaska, got got a grant from the, the from the DoD for their rare earth project, which it's just it's just not going to work. Like I don't think so. Maybe it does. Sorry, but like it's it just the metallurgy just isn't going to work. My buddy was saying so. The same one that was talking to me about the the the, the copper thing. I called him on some other weird shit that I was trying to figure out, and it was saying anyway, it's just funny. But I asked him what was mattering to him because he he works on a lot of stuff like those Rolls Royce jet engines and like crazy things, and he was saying to me that um, one of the biggest breakthroughs they've made in manufacturing as of recent, and one of the things that we should be looking at from a metal perspective, but he wasn't sure about the supply chain and what the, you know, you know, what the deposit styles, et cetera, were like. But what he was essentially saying was that um, all of these aircraft parts, so any like aircraft part, and for the most part, any, any part, Right up until um, right now, right still, they basically need to co- coat these things in chromium. Right, so everything's like for any corrosion, everything needs to be like chromium coated. So apparently, the entire process of chroming has been outlawed in like just about every single country. Like these big baths of you know, I, I guess so hazardous and so shitty for the everything that. No, like it's illegal to do it anywhere now. So that's why they don't chrome stuff anymore. Remember, like you used to see like cars, everything would be chromed. Well, there's real practical engineering value to chroming things and uh, in the manufacturing space. But they, 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 for anti corrosion, for durability and lasting long and everything. And um, so now there's like a couple of countries in the world that still chrome things. I think like in Brazil or like in like uh, uh, Cambodia or something. They have like they can still do it. So literally, the entire world sending their stuff to those places to get chromed, right? These parts. And so what they did was they developed some new manufacturing methodology of chroming, which is like this minuscule, like millimeter, I don't know, fucking microscopic, um, like bullets, effectively of chrome 
that they're shooting out of like a little gun and they're blasting um, the material, like sandblasting almost the material with this. And that's adhering the chrome to the, to the, to the, to the metal and providing the coating. So they've got this new manufacturing methodology of adhering the chrome and like coating, providing these chrome coatings. Isn't this just like spray painting? Yeah, effectively. At like a high velocity. Like a high velocity with some fancy yeah. machine because you're doing it. It's metal, right? Yeah, like yeah. you're shooting like a metal at a metal. What happens if you stick. stand in front of that? Probably, it probably yeah. cut you, man. Yeah, like. Probably cut you pretty bad. Probably cut your finger off, put, like your finger in front of it. It's yeah. like, I, I, as I understand it, right? So he's yeah. explaining to me. It's a bombarding whatever it is with this. So I guess this like step change in the manufacturing process, allegedly it's not that expensive mm. to manufacture this on scale. Like to build these things, like this mouse trap on scale. So um, what he's saying is that's going to be huge because now chroming will be back as like a cheap and obviously necessary step in nearly all manufacturing. Yes, the ring of fire. So where yeah. you get the chrome? Right? You play the chrome, Every, right? Yeah. Ring of fire, free west. Every- yeah. Nah. Every time I hear of Chrome and Ring of Fire, remember that uh, Free West. It got bought by that, Cliffs for a dollar for a side Nora video. Remember, and she's like, "We got Cro- Chromium," and she's in a bikini in the in the field, and they got in so much trouble. No they're way. like, "This is sexist," and they're like, "This is promotion, baby." And she's, you don't remember that? I don't remember that. <laughs> oh, they, that's absurd. Yeah, oh, we'll find it. She's like, "We got Chromium." That's 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 awesome. That's awesome. So should we talk some names? Should we talk names at all? So I, I, I'm interested in Chrome. I'm, I'm interested in Chromium um, to like look at this from that perspective, if that's real. I don't know what the supply demand thing is, but it sounds like the demand's going to be huge. All I know about that is that that was the first name I ever invested in that was a, was a venture mover. I think I put like $500 or something at like 10 cents and it was a dollar. And I was like, this is, it was 09. And I was like, this industry is so easy. <laughs> and it was when Free West gets bought and, Everyone was so excited about the Ring of Fire and Noront and bikini clad here to here. They go up to the top. Bikini clad Ring of Fire video blasted as archaic. That's well, Steph. It's right there. Yeah, go click top. on it, Steph. Click on that stuff. Come on, no one's looking here. <laughs> Anyways, um, awesome names. Or you want to end off on a fun note? Some exciting things coming up, maybe. Just a story before that. So my buddy, last piece on this, talking to an engineer about possibly cool mm. metals. Yeah, titanium. I asked him about that. And he said, that's the GOAT, the greatest of all time. That is literally the pinnacle of the mountain. If you can figure out, he said, right now, the only way to use titanium for stuff, like for what they want to use it for, like let's say you want, like it's, it's literally like the miracle metal. Like they yeah. could build fucking everything out of titanium if they could. But he's like, and there's no shortage of like titanium in the world, right? But the, the problem is the manufacturing side. It's, it's being able to, like, I guess you can't cast it. So you can't pour it in like a molten state and cast parts with it and cast things with it. You have to like literally, um, like you have to machine everything out of blocks of pure titanium. So they have to take like a, an ingot and they have to keep it into an environment that's anoxic so it doesn't oxidize. And then they have to machine it out of that pure thing. And it's so expensive and cost prohibitive to work with the titanium. Otherwise, it would be everywhere. So anyway, that's what I learned a little thing about titanium beyond usage. That's pretty interesting. I think that that even ties into, but the production side of it, like the, the, there is no shortage of titanium, but there's shortage of recoverable titanium for cheap. Okay. That's, that's the biggest thing. So in Russia and China, it's standard story, right? Like it's like the rarer story really where they have these, the, some sands where they can recover the titanium easily. Um, and then everything else is not. And so you need the right mineralogy to do it. Um, and so that's, that's the thing about this project in Australia is that it's all the right mineralogy to be able to do it, but still they need a pilot plan to do it, et cetera, et cetera. But that is the, that's another prohibitive thing is that it's so expensive to get enough of it that I can imagine if it's already so expensive to make anything out of it, like you're just, it's never going to advance. Right. Allegedly it's like the miracle metal though. Like he's saying, Dr. Dan, he's telling me all the goodies. So it's the best. Well, that's good. Well, there's a lot of it there. <laughs> there's there's going to be a lot of it. <laughs> hey, Steph, can you, um, for fun, we're one month in, into uh, the stock picking competition. Let's just see what the top three is and uh, call it a okay. Call it a conference. I mean, uh, call in, it in a, which? 
Who's stock picking? The CEO one? Yeah, just just. I haven't even looked at this at all, by the way. I don't know. CJ, I got to say, one of the topics also, I definitely will say that one of the big things that I found from VRIC is that everyone was asking about the Northern Miner, Mining.com CEO combo. People were very excited about that. Yeah, and like with every acquisition that we've done in the past, the hardest, like we love the vision of what we want to put it to get, like the, the end vision. But uh, integration always takes a little always takes a little bit longer than uh, what you think it does because they come in with their own systems and procedures and policies. But you know we we already have um, great new products in the market right now. So if anyone wants to lever CEO.ca and our, our and our new partners to what you said, get more eyeballs on their stories. Uh, feel free to reach out to us. Okay, so here are the. Here's the, the leader right now has, was the Aston Bay, MDM, MDMA. MDMA, Aston Bay. And NUR. And you, what's NUR? Well, it's only up 5%, so I don't know oh, if that's probably the one we want to be looking yeah. at. Uh, Aston Bay. Oh. Aston Bay's ripping. Why is Aston yeah. Bay ripping? Dead cat bounce. So we all know Aston Bay, 20% owner of the Seven Hosted Copper thing up in north, 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 none of it. Oh, shit. You just brought up Nunavut. of it. What's going on? Matt, did you see that with the whole government thing with the, the feds giving over noon of it? No. To noon of it? I didn't actually. Jesus Christ. You guys, I came back from this trip going, how do you think this is going to affect it? And everybody, like, I'm breaking the news for everybody for the first time. Okay. So what happened was uh, it's the biggest land transfer deal in Canadian history. Uh, the federal government signed over all of the rights of noon of it to the noon of it province. So it's not part of Canada anymore? It is in a sort of weird um, Northwest Territories kind of way. Okay. I don't, I don't understand. I don't understand at all. Basically, yeah. the, the, is the Northwest are, Territories part of Canada? They are, but they're, they, they control all of their resources and what gets developed, what doesn't get developed, and they don't have to listen to the feds. So up until now, the feds were a roadblock or perceivably, maybe they weren't, but maybe the, the province was. But up until now, perceivably, you needed to get your project approved by the province, and then you would have to get it approved federally as well. And the federal government had last say on what got to be built, what didn't get to be built, what minerals or, or oil and gas or energy things would get exploited and not exploited, all that stuff. It belonged to the feds, belonged to Canada. It doesn't anymore. It belongs to the, prov it belongs to the territory of Nunavut, as far as I understand it. Again, I was kind of hoping that I would come in here and drop the tidbit of knowledge that I had on this, and then we would get, you know, we would be able to like peel it back and understand it better, but that's okay. I think I don't understand it I'll completely. Go, I'll go learn about it. <laughs> yeah, no, no, for sure. Um, it'll be good for another podcast, but I think, I think um, it's important. Like, I, 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 so I would have expected to see some effect on possibly some Nunavut deals. But did it change? It, does the Northwest Territories become a more attractive place? If it's, if it's like the Northwest Territories, all I know about the Northwest Territories is that not much gets built. Is it like, so I would be like, well, if it's that, then does that really change? Does, that, does it give them a huge grant of money so that they can make things work? The premier of, the premier of Nunavut, Mr. Agal, uh, anyway, Peach. So PJ had some comment to CBC, et cetera, or some of the news outlets on this and said, this is a great step for Nunavut to take power and control over the, 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 uh, the, the, um, um, the resource projects and their development. And it, he, he sort of painted it in a connotation that the feds were holding them up and holding Nunavut back. And now they can take the power into their own hands and accelerate things. So I'm wondering if companies that had exposures to Nunavut properties um, would... I don't know. I don't think it matters. I mean, Baffin, Baffin Land got built. It was fine eventually. Then what's the like, Nico project on the, the side of the lake there that was an amazing project and still never worked because it was so far north? And I, I, I don't know. When you tell me that, I don't really... I don't think that changes anything for me. It's still the economics of being in Nunavut pretty much around the same time as that announcement, right? Yeah, for sure. And I guess like what Atha just bought uh, Lur, so Lur has the Angle Act deposit for uranium up there, which is the, one of the higher grade things outside of Saskatchewan. Um, it's like, I don't know, whatever it was, 4 million tons, just under a percent. Um, I don't know, it, it, it moved, but maybe that was for a different reason. I don't know, I, I wouldn't, I understand the, the reasoning for that, but 
I'm not sure that the Fed, unless you show me a project the Fed was holding up, which I don't think there are. If there's a project that the Fed was holding up because it was advancing and then like it was stuck in permitting, okay. But I don't know if that's... Well, I just think obviously you're dealing with the federal government to, 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 you know, to fight that bureaucracy, whether they're holding it up or not intentionally or just being problematic. I don't think it's like an intentional problematic thing. I think it's just bureaucracy, added bureaucracy that tends to slow things down. For sure. But when I think about a project in Nunavut, if I thought about exploring in Nunavut, the federal permitting process would not be at the top of my list of things I'd be worrying about. Right. Right. You'd be more worried about, yeah, well, for sure. I'd be, I'd be worried about the fact that I have six weeks a year to look to go to my project and search things. That would be, that would be what I would worry about. Right. That's, it's just so hard. Yeah. And having to set a camp up like a year in advance. <laughs> yeah. And one, and one, one year is just fuel. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. For real. Yeah. It's not, it's not the best. Okay, anyway, so that's okay. the top pick. That's the top of the year so far. Is that yeah. the one? It is a cool, it's a cool project. If it was, it's, it's a cool project. He's winning it. All the hitters got bay. Yeah. What's this other fault? What's what's FLT? Which one's that? 109%. FLT. FLT? FLT on uh, Sumachona. FLT, 109%. What's that deal? Watch it be like a... Drone Delivery Canada. Nice. Well, I think it's cool to note that while CEO.ca was built as a mining platform, like the most uh, trending companies are non-mining platforms because we have so much generalist money on this plat platform so no let's think no it's cool good. it's very I, cool I like to it see. all yeah drone delivery canada let's go um bay what's are we is that another uh, those probably are not mining deals yeah number seven cannabis <laughs> <laughs> i think i think cannabis is probably playing cannabis names our way we're looking at all of these we're like sweet our way I can't see any of these things on the screen, so I'm just listening to you guys. <laughs> do we talk about Bay, Aston Bay? Like, do we know? I think about we spoke Aston about Bay? it. Yeah, we spoke about Aston Bay. They went on that crazy run because their partner in Australia was. They had uh, American West owns eighty percent, ten million dollar earning. BHP has been up here for five years. This is geologically very, very cool project, right? Ten kilometer long trend sediment hosted copper, big holes, um, copper silver stuff. It's interesting. There's a whole bunch of gravity anomalies. And then whenever you have a conductor, you basically have like a hundred percent hit rate. Um, for sure. Really great project. The hard part is that it's on an Island in the North of Nunavut with six weeks a year of access. So that is the hard part, mm. but it is a, it is, they're hitting some really big holes. They put out last year, they put out a whole bunch of visuals, right? Of these massives. I think there's like a half percent, half meter, 50% copper, some, some real, very high number. But the, the hard part for them is that I think they came out with 44 meters of 2% or something like that. And so there's, there's historically really big holes, like 130 meters of 2%, 3% sort of stuff like that, that, that Kaminko drilled back in the nineties. Mm. So these guys were drilling it and the market got really excited because of these massive sulfides that they thought were there. But then the visuals, um, bit them in the ass because they came out with holes that were 44 meters, 2%, which is pretty good. Um, but then everyone was hoping that it was going to be some crazy number because the, the core that they showed was the the massives right so and it has to go really deep hey matt because you're saying that the, the well it's going to be an underground mine and so the hard part there is does it does it hang together enough to be able to create an underground mine up in there and then the hard part from that is you got to get a whole bunch of rigs up there to drill it out hoping it hangs together and you're dealing with these gravity anomalies and where they drilled was kind of the heart of the gravity anomaly and the heart of the conductor so the worry would be that there isn't enough there in each of these pods um and so that's it's, it's a hard it is a hard place to work grades because they basically have that window well you you have short windows to do everything and then you get the barge up there and you throw everything on it in that short window yeah ship enough to make money for it yeah it's tough some years there's only two weeks of a work season right so it's it's a it's a really hard place to work but it's a it's geologically a very cool spot that's why Kaminko loved it that's it's across from polaris right so it's like right across the little channel um, so that's what Kamiko was looking for in the nineties. They're looking for another giant zinc thing. And then they found this copper thing. Um, and so it's been known for about 30 years and then Bay was with it. And then BHP again came in and tried to earn it in 2016, 17, then left it. And then these Australians came in and drilled these big holes and got this really big story going. I think that the, the asset was worth 260, 270 million if you put the value of the two companies together at the height. Um, and then, um, like the financing overhang came and everything fell off. Well, this is for after this pod, but I've got, a. I found something cool. I found something cool we should talk about. Like a like a potential um, 
opportunity. The uh, it's neat though when things are beat up like this. There's some real there's yeah. some real gems out there right now. Yeah. Well, people look at the Canadian seasonality. I forget who's. I think you and Jim were talking about it, right? Where it's like sell after the summer or after the assays, and then buy going into drilling. Yeah. Every year, you could probably do that. Um, no, this is going back to remember our chat about like inventories and like like actual like brownfield sites, like inventory ounces and like things with meat on the bone. Yeah. More like that. At like very discounted prices. So I think I think now's a good time. I was looking around and like this is a pretty good good one, but I was looking at like I was looking around and it's not alone. There's quite a few things that are like that. And more and more I'm thinking, you know what? With with gold prices the way they are, some of these th- assets that are lying dormant with, you know, a few hundred thousand ounces and like good solid grades. Um, brown fields, like they produced in the last 10, 15, 20 years, there's value in those. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We just bought into a deal that probably has about a, a million ounces of uh, just over a gram in oxide in Nevada with like 10, $20 million of replacement infrastructure and water rights, $6 million pre money. Six. There you go. So there you go. So it's like, it's a, it's a great, it's a really cool project. Smart people involved. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's it's yeah it's a weird it's just interesting space out there right like it's it's as long I think access is a big thing because if you have limited money still though like it's got to be like we we got hit with that in Adeline right like for for Sterling right where you you have like this one shot and it's just like so I wish I could just buy these assets and sit on them that that would be almost like what I would do these all these like two three hundred thousand ounces kind of thing yeah and just sit on them like aggregate it's just hard to aggregate but you know what I mean like just when you see a couple things like that you almost want to just buy them and park them you know like I, I i like unequivocally i know with the real estate the area code where it is what it is grades etc it will eventually. i feel like we have a big interest in a gold company that has some money that probably could do that <laughs> <laughs> cough cough <laughs> all right well that's great all right guys let's wrap it up 2024 let's go we're back Woo! next Thank week you. see you matt cheers take it easy guys